So yes. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture's first webinar, this week featuring Dr. Bruce Bernstein. Bruce Bernstein is one of the leading authorities on Southwest Native Arts. A trained ethnologist, he has worked as a curator and museum director in Santa Fe and Washington, D.C. He presently serves as Director of Innovation and Chief Curator of the Ralph T. Coe Center for the Arts and Historic Preservation Officer for the Pueblo of Coaque. His previous positions include Director for Collections and Research at the National Museum of the American Indian, a branch of the Smithsonian, Chief Curator and Director of Santa Fe's Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and Laboratory of Anthropology, and Executive Director of the Southwestern Association for Indian Arts, or SWIA. Bernstein has published broadly on Native Arts and Museums, as well as curated over 100 exhibitions. His PhD in Anthropology is from the University of New Mexico. Bernstein has dedicated his three decades of work in museums to collaborative work and modeling new partnerships in researching methodologies, methodologies, curatorial principles, and practices, contributing to today's working model of inclusive collections and exhibition programs. Today, Bernstein will be talking about the Pueblo of San Ildefonso and the founding of the Museum of New Mexico. The talk complements our current exhibition that Bernstein co-curated with members of the Pueblo, San Ildefonso Pottery, 1600 to 1930, Voices of the Clay, which you can see at MIAC when we reopen. One last note before we kick this off, next week we'll be joined by Dr. Steve Lexen, professor and retired University Museum Curator of Archaeology at the University of Colorado Boulder, who will discuss Chaco Canyon and Cahokia Mounds, which is across the river from St. Louis in Western Illinois. The two great regional centers of American civilization north of Mexico in the 11th and 12th centuries. A thousand miles apart, the two cities were exactly contemporary and each transformed its respective region. Lexon will compare and contrast their histories, exploring if and how the two cities might have interacted. I did want to call your attention to the one logistical feature of Zoom, and that's the Q&A button. That's the place to ask questions since participants are muted during the webinar. Okay. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Bruce Bernstein. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I really appreciate and trying out this new format. I'm going to put up my PowerPoint. Um, And this is probably new to many of us how to do this. Of course, I've given talks uh, previously. And please, uh, there's no way to interrupt me and ask raising your hands, but there is the uh, there is a way to do that through the questions, as Andy mentioned. So please do that. As I was working on the talk, I was looking at images of pottery, and I was thinking that this would be a perfect uh, talk at some point was just to show you an image like this and we could help sort them out. And I think this is one of the things that when we tend to look at a community like San Juan de Paul, so uh, <clears throat> we tend to think of it in a very fragmented way. <clears throat> of course, museum collections are naturally fragmented or just small slices of things just to, in terms of how a museum collects. But what do we really know about the community and have we really heard about the community? And one of the things uh, get this to work. And one of the things I often think about is, um, so we've got these objects on the shelf, and uh, what about the spaces in between? And I think those spaces in between are an important reason, um, give us important clues in terms of what we're looking at. It's the things that perhaps can't be collected. It's the cosmological, it's the social aspects of things. And I think that's important. Uh, as Andy mentioned, I co-curated the exhibition with Eric Fender and Russell Sanchez. I put with Eric and Russell here because I did this on my own without really talking too much, but you'll see how they're in the, in the talk itself. And hopefully they're on the talk and will ask me some pithy questions. So Sal of the Fonts with the creation of museum, it is the museum's first collection. And I think that's important. And uh, I just realized that you should be seeing things like this instead of my view. And um, sorry about that. 
And anyways, it is the museum's first collection. Those first collections were, were from the Pajarito Plateau, and they were all more or less pre-1600. The San Alfonso was also the first exhibitions. Some of those rooms have been recreated in the Palace of the Governors for many years. There are also some of the paintings that were shown in the New Art Museum, as well as some of the first styles of pottery. San Alfonso provided the ethos of community-based collaborative work. Uh, uh, 20 or so San Alfonso men, along with their wives and families, accompanied about 10 white men and archaeologists. And really, uh, I think by example, showed uh, the archaeologists some things about working together. Uh, San Alfonso is the impetus or the reason for Santa Fe Fiesta and the Santa Fe Indian Market. And it's the only collection in the museum system in the four museums, particularly in uh, Santa Fe, uh, that are used through the museum system. So just some things to consider. A lot of this, I just want to lay out some groundwork. We need a new, new, better nuance, better understanding of value of native arts. If we know more about the context of the making art, increases our appreciation. It allows us to see more of the beauty, and transposing means can diminish the beauty of a piece. We have an obsession with names and single individuals when we think and talk about uh, San Alfonso, particularly pottery. But what about the community-based things about that? And this is my dictum, really. Uh, just forget everything we think we know, uh, because we don't know much when it comes to So here's some things to consider that I'll be emphasizing. Uh, things are all community-based. The community does care for itself. The, sentence, the sentience of actions and people, uh, people at San Alfonso are the protagonists. It's not Hewitt, it's not Chapman. They're just in reaction to, it's quite different than the way history and anthropology museums are written, that the curators did this, that somebody handed a person a shirt and asked them to duplicate that shirt. And I hope to show you some reasons why that doesn't really work so well. And I really think about these two words, we toss around these words, accuracy and authenticity. And I think the community only shows accuracy of what it is and who they are and who they've always been. Authenticity is our obsession with whatever that means. In this, in this uh, brief statement from Alfonso Ortiz, one of my mentors, the idea of change and constant change and just skipping down towards the bottom of that little passage, this pattern of extensive trade and exchange was not so much altered by the Spanish as Americans as it was augmented. We like to think that, that uh, uh, native cultures are, again, static and unchanging and unable to absorb and adopt. But it's really the native people in the village who are making those changes. And some of the power of the villages are these types of things. And we're privileged here at Santa Fe to be able to go out and see these uh, types of events, these dances, which are visual prayer. And the dance and song which are the continuation of people. It's not an enact creation, but it's a continuation of the creation of the world. And being in these sacred spaces allows people to have a continuity uh, in their culture. It's always in an act of becoming. It's always in an act of It's not something that, that's, again, static. Now, Edgar Hewitt, the founder of the museum, described the Pueblos as buried in the debris of time and submerged by foreign influence. And Hewitt believed the Pueblo was nine-tenths archaeology now. So these are, these are uh, contemporary photos of uh, um, contemporary in the sense they're both taken right about 1910, uh, 1912, and the one on uh, your, the left facing the screen are San Alfonso men working up in archaeology. And then the, at the same time, you can see this vibrant village, San Alfonso, and this is where people live. You can see the houses and the fields, there's a the bigger building in the background is the church. You can see right in the middle of the photograph, if you're familiar with the big cottonwood that uh, graces uh, the north side plaza of the community. It's a little more, it's a little differently configured than it is now, but that's another story. But anyways, Hewitt really thought that the evidence of San Alfonso was in the dirt up there at Barrido, and not so much where people were living. He was right, it is in the evidence of the dirt, but to think that was nine tenths gone, I don't think is quite right. And he would also believe that he needed to save San Alfonso through re-education of them about their ceremonies, which he called the House of the Sun. And he found this ceremonial cycle uh, and taught people this ceremonial cycle, and he asked them to reenact this ceremonial cycle at the Santa Fe Fiesta. Um, and again, one is authenticity, uh, and, the other is and the other is accurate. So on the right side of the screen, that's Agapito Pino, 
uh, leaning against uh, one of the Kiva houses at the Pueblo. In the middle is a 1910 shot of people dancing. Clearly, there's nothing inaccurate about people dancing and participating in their communities. But if you look on the right, on the left side of the screen, you can see the reenactments that Hugh would have. That's Hugh uh, in the far left of that picture of the float coming down, the prehistoric trade. This is the March of Time parade they did for the 1920 uh, fiesta. And on that float are some museum, what we call museum collections. Uh, and uh, uh, the men walking around are all Santa Fe, uh, San Alfonso men. They've got uh, shields, cardboard shields painted by Fred Bodie slung over their shoulders. And the man standing at the very back against the back wall is uh, Julian Martinez. Here you can see some of the uncomfortableness of people performing. Uh, the I'm looking at the photo below it now, the two eagle dancers, uh, Julian Josita, Josita, uh, Josito Montoya and, uh, and Crescencio Martinez in the middle. You can see just a little bit of, of uncomfortableness in that. So we have to ask ourselves uh, that Pueblo people are the most essential element in creating the museum and the School for Advanced Research and the Indian Arts Fund. And they get a little help from Hewitt, no doubt. So we always hear about this mover and shaker idea and who put things in motion and create them. And, I want to say it's Wayama and Antonio Pena Vigil, who was cacique at, um, at San Alfonso and really um, was, a, uh, was a rock and foundation for all the ways that Hewitt thought about uh, how the museum might be. I mean, that Hewitt standing with Wayama, if that's not clear. And this is partly where the relationship begins. Somewhere about 1898, maybe 96, uh, uh, he would started traveling in the area as a way in the summertime he was teaching. In the summer he would travel a great deal uh, to the dryness uh, and Al his wife who was suffering from respiratory disease. And um, the idea was uh, um, he started then looking around and he saw all the evidences, all the uh, villages and all the other uh, things that people continue to use up there to today. So in 1907 he got some funds and uh, he began to do the excavations. He did these excavations at uh, Tauni uh, in 1908, uh, and he had about 20 um, San Alfonso men with him. And this is the ancestral home to San Alfonso, about 1375, 1550, four people moved and eventually to where they are along the east side of the river today. Um, you know, and so you've got to ask uh, why, why are people and I think it's to get a little bit of ac accuracy in things. So during these first years, 1907 to 1915, uh, claimed by Hewitt and a lot of people since, it should be maybe a lot, not most, uh, he founded the Pueblo Watercolor Movement. And he wrote about it in painting, the recovery of an lost art has been accomplished. It ranks as the most noteworthy achievement of the Santa Fe the programs, the museum, the Fiesta, Indian Fair was now in the market. He took credit for the pottery revival that began while he was still a teenager in Illinois, while Hewitt was still a teenager in Illinois. In other words, that the pottery revival took place beginning in the 1870s, long before he had any thoughts or knowledge of the pottery to plateau or Pueblo people. And he thought that replication of pottery from pre-1600 uh, was uh, uh, authenticity, that between 1600 and when he met people, uh, there had been changes, and those changes come from Spanish and American and Mexican cultures. And he thought any of those changes uh, made people less pure, less authentic. So he was focused on this replication idea. And he also thought that he brought tradition back to San Alfonso by solving some, some internal problems, what we call out loud factionalization. And he did this with his friend Wyama, and this is a quote from one of his writings The old hut of the rain priest on the hill overlooking the shrine has fallen down and is no longer used. Here through many an evening, I sat at the feet of the most revered teacher of anthropology, Olayama. Doesn't sound maybe so bad out of context, but <clears throat> that, that comment really gives you a sense that he's living in a hut, he's not in a house, uh, and he's overlooking this shrine. He says, but it's fallen down. In other words, it's at the end of its life, it's at the end of its time. And uh, Wayama told him everything he ne needed to know, um, uh, which is very doubtful. Uh, but he had this idea of himself being there and being the last person to be with Wyoming. 
And he played that out in many ways. And this idea of ceremonialism, he brought back to the village. And he thought he did that for the Santa Fe Fiesta. <clears throat> now, I want to now talk about a few of the things that Hewitt forgot to mention. Now, one of the things about a revival, like I mentioned just briefly, the idea of revival for Hewitt was about replicating pre-1600 pottery. He thought that was the only authentic pottery, and he needed to do that. But, you know, revivals are necessary and needed and have occurred many times over pottery's 2,000-year history. And I think that uh, as, as great social changes happened in the Pueblos, uh, pottery shifted. At San Alfonso, you see the shift happening. People have the great migration from the, from the north. When the Spanish arrived to colonize, when the Spanish returned in the post-revolt era, you see it again in the middle part of the 18th uh, century. You see it again with Americanization, with the quickening of Americanization, the rise of the cash economy and, uh, and more uh, and greater uh, governmental programs like boarding schools, more, more unfair uh, land and, and water usurpment and, and so on. But each time people uh, did this revival and one of the most prevalent things that is left out of the conversation as far as the way we talk about the museum's creation is revival of pottery that we hear so much about with Martinez family, uh, and, uh, and, and Tanita Royball and others is that the, it's, uh, dis, it's discussed as if it began when he handed Maria Martinez that, that pottery shirt in 98, uh, which is not true at all. Began in the 1870s, again, a time when Hewitt wasn't even in New Mexico. The two women mostly in, uh, that we can align with that time is Yellow Deer and Marianita Royball. <clears throat> and uh, they revived uh, uh, imbued pottery uh, yet again with Pueblo intellect and consciousness. 1870 is an interesting date. If you know your American history, consider what's happening in the 1870s. It's just post-war, post-Civil War. There's a great deal of militarization in the United States. And that's put to, uh, it's put to, uh, by the government, it's put out west, where they want to, as I've said at the time, solve the Indian problem. And it created a lot of legislation, a lot of things. Grant, when Ulysses Grant became president, he thought the best people to run the Indian service and, the, and keep treaty rights with Native people were the uh, evangelical Christians, and that brought uh, new ideas into the Pueblo of Well. And the idea of losing land and water and no defenses by the government over their loss, there might be no defenses if people went to court, they were disquieted. Uh, so San Alfonso people were losing land and water rights. So this 1870s is about reigning, reviving, reminding people who they are, and that the authority and agency of, of the community is depicted or in the pottery itself. Now this is Hewitt's idea of, of replica as authenticity. So on the right-hand side, the far right bowl is a bowl that he excavated, uh, and it's about it's it's probably about uh, maybe not as early as 14, uh, maybe 1450, 1500 excavated at uh, uh, Otui, and the bowl, just the smaller bowl, is a, pretty much a direct copy of it. You can see it's a little stilted. He, the, pre, the people who made the bowl on the left of the bowl could not replicate it, but they used clay of the time. They used it's the same paint, but it looks very different the way that they laid it out. So this was one way, and this was a very particular person who copied archeological pottery. Uh, and, that, and that person is uh, Julian Martinez. The pot on the left side is a response of Crescencio and Ana Martinez. It's a very different type of response. He had a different position in the village, a position of some great authority in the village, of great responsibility to the village. Uh, Julian didn't share those high levels of responsibilities uh, with, with Crescencio. And I think um, because of those responsibilities, Crescencio kept more to the dictum of, uh, uh, as people continue to say today, as Russell always reminds me, take what I know, but make it yours. Whereas you can see, Julian was working on the idea of copying where um, uh, Crescentio took the idea of paint as his life understood what he was looking at, not as something to copy. And I think, again, that has to do with their different positions. This is something that's just come up and, uh, I, I, I tell you, I've told this story so many times the year, over, over the years, and um, so grateful the other day on the phone, Russell Sanchez, one of my co-authors, co-curators, said uh, she never would have used that lump of clay. 
because uh, she wouldn't know what it was. Like a gracious, generous Pueblo person, she took that lump of clay uh, from, from um, Hewitt when he off was offered to him, offered to her rather, uh, and she probably used her own clay to make this little box. And Julian then copied this well, water serpent. It's the first water serpent uh, specifically made to sell. And again, Julian's ability because of his, his position in the community and he would copy a, a piece of rock art. Crescentio may not have been so easy to uh, copy a piece of rock art, that, uh, but rather look at it again through a filter of who he is. Now, the idea of change in pottery is longstanding, and I think it's important to understand how much pottery changes over time. So just a few examples of types of changes that pottery have. You can see the, legs, the necks getting longer on these types of pots. It's kind of a progression of ideas, same materials in all three of these pots. Again, this idea in these pots is the same sort of thing where you've got from the previous, you've got this white, uh, uh, black on cream in the upper left. You can see now it's got a bulge around the belly of the pot and that's painted in that area. It's got a long neck now, makes it very different for carrying water. And then on the right hand side of the upper piece of tail polychrome, this is a type of pottery that I think is in reaction to colonization uh, by the Spanish and uh, a long neck with a red a polished uh, background. This has some etching on it. You can take a good look. You can see the corn plants that are etched into the red on this particular plant. The designs on the bowl to the pot, the middle bowl to the pot, are not so different than what would have been done uh, 100 or 200 years before, but the uh, looks different in the way that it's constituted in, in this piece of pottery. The Sacona polychrome uh, is another way that people divide out the uh, beginning to paint the neck of the pot versus the table polychrome that's not painted. Uh, as another one of my mentors, Jerry Brody, always said there's lumpers and splitters, and I think I'm probably a lumper and not a splitter. Uh, and this is what happens when people try and copy this stuff. So the uh, pot on the lower left is a copy of, of, a, a, um, of a biscuit ware. It just doesn't work very well. I want to move on and show you some other things that Hewitt totally ignored that were going on in the world um, uh, in the Pueblo uh, before he came along. Again, I've, I've kind of made the point, a little bit of sarcasm, I do agree, uh, that, uh, that apparently Levance will start its life or found itself again when Edgar Hewitt showed up. I don't think that's true. These four pots are all pottery made in the mid part of the 18th century, the 1780. They're all pieces of pottery that are brand new. These are, are very, very new. It's a new idea as people took wheat into the villages uh, to grow, that people knew how to grow wheat and so forth. But people really started working with wheat uh, as a crop in the middle of the 18th century. There's a series of things and changes that people needed. But for us, looking at the materiality of the village, one of the changes are these great big jars that were needed to store the wheat. These are big, heavy jars. They're far bigger, uh, twice or, or three times the size of previous storage jars that had existed. Uh, and uh, this was used to store wheat. That's clothing and meat and other articles of wealth. You can see some of the iconography. The lower left are some feathers, like a fan, a feather, and then going up just to the right of that on the same pot in the lower left, like uh, clouds going up or uh, feathers going up into the sky, constellation figures. Uh, there's some more examples of this. There's some extraordinary pottery uh, that went on. In Hewitt's mind, again, because we're picking on Hewitt today, uh, he would think all of this is inauthentic and inauthentic because it is post-Spanish settlement. It's post-Pueblo uh, revolt. This is something people did to fortify themselves, to remind themselves uh, of who they are. Uh, and every time you use the pottery, it's a visual prayer and using that pottery. And again, we talked about the Bible. If you're looking at these, at these pots, um, you can see up, up here, if you can see the cursor, but up here, uh, uh, this, this design here is up here on this pot here, and it's right here. So it's not a matter of tossing out what's gone on before, but again, it's the idea of making it your own. Oops. Uh, and this idea then, too, sometimes 
like these are reconstituted. You don't see that biscuit wear black on cream designs on these big uh, Ogopogi pots. And so sometimes, like with this big jar by Julian Martinez Maria, the one on the lower right, uh, people needed to rethink the design iconography uh, for, for reasons to make it work better. I mentioned this 1870 to 1900 period was a period of rapid social change. These are just a few examples of pottery that came out of this period. People were experimenting with new bowl shapes, with making, uh, men were painting these sort of figurative story pots. People were using ink or maybe laundry bluing here on a pot like this. People were using, um, again, this black and red uh, pottery and then pots like this made by Florentino and Martino Flint. Um, <clears throat> Now this is an extraordinary time, and it's, I think that uh, my confusion about it came to forefront of my mind, um, and uh, in the sense that, um, oh, I think I know who made that pot, and then I look at it, think, oh, I don't know who made that pot. These are two really good examples, but two very, very close in terms of the way that the pots are laid out. They have a body design, they have a neck, they have a shoulder design, and a neck design. They have sometimes things coming down off the rim of the pot, like here. Um, and um, let me see if I get the, uh, well, that won't work. I was just trying to see if I get the pointer. So I don't know if the pointer is working or not. I'm going to see if I can, whoops, sorry about that. I was going to see if I could find the pointer. I guess not. Um, and again, these sort of brand new ideas. So again, these sort of um, three three bands of design one, the middle with this uh, hatching like that, then here on the neck, all of those designs. These are obviously very close pots as well. Uh, there's Anna Tate. Thank you, Andy, if you did that. I appreciate that. So what I'm looking at now, three bodies of design right in here. So on the belly of the pot, up here on the shoulder, and then up here in the neck, and then sometimes some things coming off the, off the, um, off the uh, lip of the pot as well. You can see how close these pots are. It's very probably um, they're both made by the yellow deer. Probably made both of the pots, and then um, uh, different people painted them. However. And that's partly what's showing. The other thing, this is the 1870s, this use of red and black like this. You see this red and black, black and red, right, all the way through this. And these leaf forms here, uh, I continue to think they're, they're somewhat influenced uh, by uh, pot, uh, villages to the um, west of San Alfonso. Uh, I don't know if I'm right about that, but I continue to think that. Um, Why are we stuck? We're stuck, Andy. Shoot. Okay, what seems to be the oh, problem? There it goes. Oh. That did it. Thank you. Okay. Can you see the screen all right? Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> but it's all right? Yes. Okay. Um so these these pots here, then uh, we've got this. So this is this one very important woman who I've called Yellow Deer, which is the translation of this Tailwind name right here. I'd say, which I can never say right. I always get a smile when I try and say that word. Uh, but that's her. That was how, that's how you would translate that deer yellow. And these are her her English or baptismal names: Tonya Pena, Tonya Pena, Pena, Tonita Pena V. Hill. Uh, and she worked on these pots with Florentino and uh, Martina Montoya. And that's what I wanted to point out, this idea of families, uh, uh, that in these pots, in these pots, um, in these pots, you know, that you can see that they're very similar in shape, the way the necks are done, the way the lips are done up in these pots, they're laid out the same. But the hand in painting, look at the birds, is a good example. Look how these birds are done, rendered. Right, you see how different they are. Three different people uh, probably painted those three pots. 
And that's the problem. Time I go and use that, Andy, it won't let me. Well. Help me, Andy. Oh, it seems I, I see I see what I'm doing wrong. Okay. I got it. I think I got now what the problem is. Okay. Um after reclick. So this is uh Domingita Martinez Pena. Um is a mother to Presencio Martinez and Tanita Martinez. Uh, uh, then um, Roy Ball, we know her more as Tanita Roy Ball, one of the great potters. But to, uh, Dominguita is a generation after Yellow Deer. And this is some of the extraordinary work that, uh, that she did. Just really, really extraordinary. You can see the variety of things, the shape variety. She really uh, did a lot of black on red. This was a style invented in the 1870s maybe 1880 or so and really carrying very important things this spot up here in the middle um these uh these these little circles here i didn't realize but these are probably like big drops of rain that come <clears throat> in the in the summertime you could see sort of cloud formations you can see field formations up and down, night and day. Some of the most important types of things that, um, oh, there we go. This is another potter that we've been really fortunate to find out something about. We just found these photographs of her and her husband. So this is uh, Ignacio Sanchez and her husband, Facundo Sanchez. These are Russell Sanchez's great grandparents. Uh, and uh, we know a little bit about her work. I think this bowl epitomizes her work in the sense of um, this line work, these parallel lines that she did. You can see it on this pot that's in my collection that's been buried down on the lower shelves downstairs for so many years. I never really got much, got very far thinking about it, but Russell and Eric both have been terrifically helpful. And then we find this photograph of her uh, began because of the sleuthing by, by Russell and Eric in the community and asking people questions and finding out things. This is a potter who's very much contemporaneous with Hewitt, but uh, you know, he never mentions her. This is, these are some of her works, uh, some identified, not identified, but again, a great potter. Um, and there are a great deal of her work that's in uh, New York. This is another great potter. Uh, she died in uh, 1918, the flu epidemic. This is Dolorita V. Hill, and I include both postcards. I just think these postcards are great. Uh, my friend Tom Peckin says these came from uh, Jesus Candelario, the old original trading post. And you can see her style slipping down all very often down the base. This one's not. You can see, how she, again, body, shoulder, neck design, and just the way she thought about those things. You can see her famous lineage as well. She's a very, very famous lineage. So, um, uh, her her father, Dolorita's uh, father, is the brother of Martina the Hill, that's the Florentino and um, Martina Cipriano the Hill is another very well-known potter, working a great deal, but someone Hewitt never talks about, he only talks about people that he knows. And then here's Florentine, Florentino and Martina Montoya, and again, you see the variety of their work. Um, Here's a potter that's clearly, this is uh, noted in the exhibition, we put these all in a line, and these pots have fascinated me for a long time, clearly by the same hand, but we don't know who the, who the maker of these pots are. We really don't have, we have some clues maybe at this point, 10, 1915. And again, this is a period of time when everybody talks about the generative nature of pottery in the village. People aren't looking at what's being made in the village, this potter's working at the same time. This potter's working at 1910. This potter's working 1910. Those potters are working 1910. So you can see it's kind of problematic to suggest um, that uh, all things started with Edgar Hewitt. Um, and again, just going back, you know, that, uh, you know, why I'm gonna pick these guys to go up with uh, Hewitt? He picked them because they were sheep. And we wonder why he, even could think about people digging through people's graves and shrines up there. But part of it 
uh, perhaps was to try and control the situation somehow, somehow to have these initiated men go up and maybe steer people away from these places to pray and protect those places. Uh, it's a very complicated thing and I really don't have a, a, a good uh, idea uh, to share with you about that. And I think that for Hewitt, I just think this is a direct quote as I understand it, uh, written this morning, uh, but dumb luck, I didn't know these people understand their culture well enough to choose the right initiated men. Did I even understand what initiated means? Thank you, Wyama. So he's finally thanked them today, which I think is fitting. And again, this is the place, this is one of the places that worked a great deal over the years. Um, and there's very few photographs of people working up, the native people working up in the Pajarita Plateau. If you think about the famous pictures of the archeologists, where is the crews of native people who worked up there? But we can see how here they're kind of, uh, I'm looking, uh, let's see. Kind of over here in this photo, you can see how they're doing the eagle dance. Looks like for the edification of these people here is a woman here in this hat, underneath the hat. Uh, this is Ana Martinez, um, husband, wife of Crescencio Martinez. And this is at Odui in 1916. This is a bowl in the Museum of New Mexico's collection. And he's here with um, Atalano Montoya, one of his uncles. And this is every day at lunch, they had a procession down from where they were digging at Ocho and everybody would carry things as they came down. These are some of the few photographs we have of people. Um, and this is the type of photographs that we get, unfortunately. Um, this is one, again, this is now post Hewitt. These are some, some, some great potters. This is Tanita uh, uh, Martinez uh, and then Roy Ball. She remarried after uh, Alfredo Montoya, her, her um, First husband died in 1913, and she remarried Juan um, Cruz Roy Ball about uh, 1916, 1917, and they had a long working relationship together. And you can see some of the beautiful things. Look at this. Look at this piece here. I'm looking at this plate right here. That's just a kind of an incredible uh, piece that way. Uh, this piece here, uh, Tanita probably formed the pot. It looks like Crescencio painted the pot. She also had this idea. Of, of this sort of what we would think about as kind of a Hopi-esque way uh, of looking down on the pot. Uh, so if you think about um, the Hopi pottery um, revived by um, their terrible relatives in the first Mesa, that you really have a different viewpoint on those, on those pieces of pottery. And these are just a few examples of the different things, uh, different types of pots she made. Janina was a, um, Worked with a lot of different people through her career. This is with Crescencio here. She probably painted this piece. Um, so there's just a lot of um, a lot to think about with her. And there are a lot of experiments going on. Hewitt had nothing to do with these experiments. Uh, one of his colleagues, Kenneth Chapman, called these the most horrible pots he's ever seen. They're called hybrids, and they're black on red in the top and polychrome on the bottom. And uh, these are great pots. And these are artistic experiments by Julian and Maria Martinez. We don't hear much about people like Susanna Aguilar, who's one of the great potters of the era. Again, Hewitt didn't work much uh, with the Aguilars, so we don't tend to hear about them much um, in terms of the sort of museum. Uh, here's a very important character I've sort of alluded to a couple of times. I'm gonna speed up just a little bit. I see the time is clicking away. Um, Alfredo Montoya was uh, tragically died in 1913, but he's probably the first painter. And, uh, and they probably sat up there and talked about painting paintings, maybe because of the incessant uh, questions from the archeologists, maybe as a part of the generosity and sharing. They always painted these scenes of a, a, a buffalo and animal dances that we see as outsiders on the 23rd of January. It's also, so a dance that doesn't belong to any particular society or the north or south Kiva. So it's something that different people could do. He's a very young man uh, when he died. And you can see there are four pieces of eight and a half by 11 paper uh, glued together to make this painting in the museum's collection. He also painted pottery a great deal. These are different pots that he painted uh, probably with his mother. His mother is Nicolasa uh, Montoya. The other person I want to talk about is uh, Crescencio Martinez, I've already alluded to 
him being, if there is cognitive or someone that Hewitt took the most uh, information uh, from or, or was most impressed by during these years, is Crescencio Martinez. Martinez uh, tragically died in 1918, in June 1918, in the resurgence of the 1917 flu epidemic, which is a good note for us right now and where we are. But he too also uh, painted in a way that uh, he painted a scene of Buffalo dancers that was a public dance. It's nothing, it's, it's revealing, but uh, in terms of the de attention to detail, he, he probably painted himself as a hunter here, his blue and these blue and uh, these blue and white leggings show up again and again. And you can see the detail in which he painted everyone. He's probably people that he knew, is probably people he was dancing with at the time. Um, and these are just a few of his other paintings. Just before his death, he painted about 25 or so of these portraits of all these dances. I've always interpreted Hewitt's asking him to do that as the idea. They're almost like photographs. And the reason for Hewitt wanting to do that right at 1970, 1918, as he was ready to revitalize the fiesta. And in this way, having these uh, paintings, these paintings, uh, uh, how people dressed and so forth, he could carry on his uh, recreation of the House of the Sun ceremonies that I mentioned earlier. Crescencio was also a prolific, prolific uh, painter. He didn't get, uh, you know, if he had lived beyond 1920 into the early Indian fair days, no doubt um, his name would come up more for people. We'd be able to identify his pottery. But you can see in these two pieces over here, just in these two pieces, like this here and this here, it's so clear that these are uh, by the same hand. These are made with his wife, Ana, Ana uh, Mar Montoya Martinez. And then here's a self-portrait that he did on that pot. Speed up, Bruce. Okay, these are also pots that he worked on with his grandmother, his aunties. You can see his hand and how beautiful his hand is in, in these pots. This sort of floral design is one of his trademarks. This way of doing feathers, these slotted leaves or feathers like that. That's very much uh, something that he does all the time. He did this series of pots. Uh, he, has, he did this series of pots kind of late on. He probably did these uh, on the way to San Diego where he helped build the exposition there in 1914 to 1916. And he did a series of these pots, about 90 of these pots. They never really saw the light of day, but you can see how innovative they are. And they do have some common things, this little, this little, um, sunburst up here or sunflower up here that you see up there. Here's those feathers again. Here's those sun, little sunbursts. These are really creative, wonderful pots. Uh, uh, they got kind of lost in the audience about uh, black on black pottery. It's really unfortunate, uh, but they're fantastic um, in every way. Here's just some more samples of his work. You can see just what a talented man, how much he knew about things. So you can see this bird he painted on this particular pot here the middle feather being a sash to tell us it teaches us something about their community. Following, following that period too, there are, uh, they, they, they inspired a lot of, a lot of things, you know, we've been talk talking about the inspiration for museum, Fiesta and, and Indian Fair, but the other places where they inspired things uh, is this uh, other painters, Tinita Pena, who was born at San Alfonso and she lived at Cochiti, it's a relative of Mart Martina B. Hill, um, Montoya, who is uh, Domingita B. Hill's sister. Uh, but she began to paint, and probably began to paint after Crescencio painted about 1917, 1918. Abel Sanchez is another great, great painter. Uh, we don't hear much about his work. He painted 1920 through the 20s. He painted on and off after that. He got involved in government and some other work at that point. This is uh, Russell Sanchez's grandfather, by the way. Here's another great painter. We do hear a lot about him. I would say de Alfonso Royball, and he painted a great deal. He had a great mind, as you can see by these fantastic birds, just the creativity. We saw these birds at, in Mayak's collections. Eric and, and Russell both were very excited because you just see the creativity and just working the ideas of these sort of uh, uh, iconography, these pieces of design, and just reworking to create new things all the time. He also was a chronicler of, I think, the idea of accuracy. 
that in that upper left corner, uh, that's just not anybody working, making pottery, but there is something going on there. Uh, those are people he knows, might be his own relatives, his mother and grandmother. You can see how carefully things are done in terms of informing us about things. The one below that with all the background of that. Mountains and houses, that's about where is the one above that um, is just a little bit later. So I mentioned this idea about, um, you know, he would saying buried in the breed, the breed of time. So this is where he played out his archaeology. He thought that uh, the Santa Fe Fiesta was the place to do that. And he, through the recreation of the ceremonial cycle and history, the tricultural myth that we all live within, that he did all these things that would bring his archaeology to life, as he said, uh, we can catch our archaeology alive at fiestas through dance and historic pageantry. I, I think that sums it up. And I think also, I think this photo sums it up that um, here he is talking to the crowd. The audience is sitting out here. They're coming, they're going uh, east on palace, past the government, palace of the governors. And he's telling everybody what they should see. It's not unlike these other scenes where he's always telling people what they should see. In this opera here, this is uh, William Cadman at the piano, a famous opera writer at the time. Uh, and these are opera singers telling the story of New Mexico. Uh, the Indian Arts Fund I mentioned came out of the work. Uh, this is a great addition to Santa Fe's cultural scene and established in 1922 because of Hewitt's ignoring anything made post 1600. A group of people got together in Santa Fe and created the Indian Arts Fund in order to collect historic pottery, 1600 to 1880. That's housed at the School for Advanced Research now, Indian Arts Research Center. But the Laboratory of Anthropology funded by John D. Rockefeller was built for the Indian Arts Fund. Another story. The market, same thing again, 1922. It is the shifting of things. Uh, Hewitt uh, is losing some of his authority in town. There's some questioning about things. And what they did on this is they, this first fair, they put these pieces, I'm sorry, this piece here and this piece here, they put them out on the tables with the award winners, like, uh, I keep using the cursor. So this is an award winner. This is a piece to museum collection. This is a piece in the museum collection. And they, they did, they did it that way in order to show people potters and potters what they should be making. But the real inspiration, I think, is still right here at a place like San Alfonso. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. And uh, on this uh, on this uh, dirt plaza, I'm sure many of you have seen dances there and continue to see those things. It's not in the museum. This is not. This would be a space between the pottery. Uh, it also happens in a place like this. This is Russell's house. If you're on the if you're on the program Russell, you can see what your house looks like when you're in the middle of working on lots of different things. I can't remember this was Zinnia Market time, but you're spread out all over his house. It's really fabulous to see all that. And also, uh, I had a few pictures of showing how uh, Russell and Eric both have, have used the opportunity to visit and talk and, and to share with me, but they've learned an awful lot. Russell has translated. So I'm looking at this design up here like this. He's got this pot that he made with that design there. Here again, here's again. Here's the photograph of another pot. Well, that's that pot down here. But you can see how he's looking at the pottery, not copying the pots, not making a copy like those first Indian markets wanted you to do, not judging authenticity, but the accuracy Again, I can't get the quote quite right, but the adamancy in that take take whatever you want, but make it yours. This idea, this dictum, and that and and why and why uh, these times is so important. And then uh, this is my last slide. It just so these guys have been uh, terrific, and I hope there's some questions. Oh, there's me. You're luck. You're in luck now. So I've got a couple of questions. Please, if you have some questions, I can't, um, I can't hear you, but if you chat or question, I'm gonna do the question first. Uh, and the questions, uh, did native people work with Hewitt on the archeology span or just observe? Ah, uh, good question. Hi, Hootkins. Uh, 
they were they were the labor they were the shovel guys i'm working hard there's some uh there's very few places uh where um there's very few places where you understand what people actually were doing but it's clear from that photograph and other places they were shoveling they were also looking at things and discussing things i think those paintings came out of the idea like in the evenings people would sit around and talk about their their finds and um and uh, uh i think the san alfonso people filled out some of those uh, types of areas uh in the chat oh thank you amy i'm glad you can see the pointer i can figure this out any other questions no well i appreciate everybody taking the time to um to, to share with us today. Uh, this is just a small piece of the story. Again, the idea of the centrality and the agency of Native people helping to create the museum. Um, we lack a great deal to talk about uh, the founders, the, the outsiders like Hewitt and Chapman uh, doing so many things. And they certainly were helpful to the communities um, in their own way for their own time. But uh, without those sound of also men in particular, the people that I've mentioned Wyama, uh, G.A. Uh, De Guito, Roybal, uh, and uh, um, Crescencio, uh, there, there just wouldn't be a museum. Um, okay, well, thanks, thanks everyone for your comments. And um, you can hear from me, um, I'm very accessible. So email, phone call, love to see you all again. Everybody stay safe, be well. Uh, what an incredibly difficult, uh, time for all of us, and uh, we'll see what the world's like soon. I have one more question, Andy, and then that'll be it. Oh, it's oh, just thank you. okay. Thank you. We're set. Okay, Andy, it's your turn. Uh, that concludes today's lecture. We're so glad that you joined us on this uh, novel format for us. Uh, next week, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have Steve Lexon from the University of Colorado talking about Chaco Canyon and Cahokia Mounds, Illinois. So we'll hope, we hope you join us next week at noon on Wednesday. Thank you.